Greetings from Podcastville. The Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by Onnit. Onnit supplements. In fact, I ordered mine for the month today. I'm running a little late. I got the Mexican chocolate protein. I got a little uh, Shroom Tech Sport, a little Shroom Tech Immune. And that's it. I'm tip top Magoo ready to go. Listen, Alpha Brain, the best stuff you could take. Get your mind thinking. If you don't like it, don't work for you. Onnit will give you a money back, 100% money back guarantee. No, no, no questions asked. All right. We don't even want the product. That's how much we believe in Alpha Brain. So do yourselves a favor. Go to onnit.com right now. Take a look at the supplements, the weights, the kettlebells. You like something on the way out? Press in church. Bam! And you get yourself 10% off delivered right to your house. Me and my man, Mr. Soup, we were talking about geese. My favorite gi is a fucking uh, Fuji gi. I love it. They've been around since Johnny Sakamori. You know who Johnny Sakamori is? Neither do I, but who gives a fuck? <laughs> What I'm trying to tell you is it's the toughest gi out there. They got mats. They got shin guards. They got they got uh, kettlebells that you don't need fucking weights to. They got everything over there at Fujisports.com. So go to Fujisports, order a nice gi on the way out press. Church. And get 10% off the liberty house. Is that too much to fucking ask from you savages? Kick this fucking mule, Lee. Jesus Christ. I went to the party. It was a source party at the car museum down on Fairfax and Wilshire. I went that night, me and a couple of my friends, and we pulled up, and we knew this girl, Kadada Jones, who worked for Source or had something to do with the party, and she came out, and she was going to bring us in, and we were walking in, and honestly, it was a fucking scary party. It was like gangbangers everywhere, and we kind of went, this isn't a party we need to go to, and we split, and the next day, we heard Biggie died. We, he was murdered. That's fucking crazy. Yeah. When you felt it, you felt it in the air. It was a it was a bad vibe, man. It was just it was just a bunch of legitimately tough dudes who were looking to have a problem with somebody. You know? They weren't happy. Nobody was having fun. It was a bunch of people posturing and going like, I'm a murderer and I'll fuck you up. Don't look at me. You know? That's not that's not what you want at a party. That's not a healthy environment. No. I don't, what does that even feel? I'm just, I don't think I've even been to a party. Like, how did you recognize it? You know, you, you walk up to a party and there's 50 dudes standing outside who are all big guys who all have very angry scowls on their face and they're looking at you like, do something so I can fuck you up. Jesus. That's how you know this is not the party for me. You know, I don't know how many buildings I walked in as a as a young kid, stupid, naive, to get drugs with eight hundred dollars in my pocket, and eight hundred was a lot of money to me at the time, but it's a lot, a lot of money to somebody else. Sure. And you're walking up two flights of steps, and you know, on the second floor, there's somebody shooting in the fucking corner. They know what you're going in that building for, you know, and all of a sudden you hear a little fucking whistle in the air. It's it's a weird. You know when you're walking into a trap. I haven't walked into a trap in a long time. It's been ten, fifteen years. I remember one time in the Bronx as a kid. My mother gave me twenty bucks, ten bucks or something, and said, "Go around the corner and buy a toy." I had to be five, six, and I saw six-year-olds that didn't look like me and didn't look like the six-year-olds I played with, and I knew they were going to chase me. I was not the fucking toy store two minutes. And they were chasing me, dog. I ran to that fucking dry cleaner. And then you know. You know where you belong. And you know where you don't belong. And it's a weird fucking feeling. Yeah. Is it surprising to you guys that it doesn't seem to happen more in Vegas? Like, I don't really hear that often about people getting... Well, they don't... Gonna, listen, Vegas police... Vegas, the casinos will try to hide that so people go to Vegas. Right, yeah. They're not going to fucking, they're not going to, you know, they give you the news you want to hear. There's also a, a lot, a lot of money in tourism and a lot, yeah. a lot of influence to keep that as, you know, at as much as they can keep that kind of shit at bay because it would fuck with their profits. So I don't think they're going to allow that much awful shit to happen in Vegas. I, I mean, obviously, if we go back to the, the, the shooting at the country co concert that's pretty terrible but that's that's not frequent in vegas well now they're prepared for it yeah now that'll never happen again in las vegas nobody was ready for something like that right but it's so weird how think of las vegas that's the macro 
Right. You know how in college you have micro and macroeconomics? Sure. Think of Vegas. Think of the casino. Now, let's take it back to the micro of that, which is a bad, which is, let's just pretend for the sake of Washington Heights in 1985 in New York. For people who know what I'm talking about, the Dominicans had taken over the fucking neighborhood from 85 to 93 or 96. And all you had to do was get off that bus in Port Authority and walk down the stairs and make a left. And you could buy $30 worth or $300,000 worth. Now, you walk out of there. Uh, Ethan is working a play in New York City. Ethan wants to get a package. A couple of other people on the play want to get a package. I'm going to go get a package. I'm going up there with $1,200 in my pocket for the weekend, okay? So as soon as I walk on that block, Lisa, you're going to see spotters on all the corners. Okay, you're going to see a guy, you're going to see two guys drinking a beer that to you, in your mind, they're just two fucking street guys that are drinking a beer over there, minding their business. They're spotters. They're watching the neighborhood. And 100 yards down the corner is two more spotters. And 600 yard, 600 yard radius, they're spotters. You know why? Because the building is the investment. So what happens is, Lee Syed, who lives in 914, what the fuck is 914? Rochester County. County, that's where white kids have money, and they come over with twelve hundred dollars every Friday. That's just you. Think of all the thousands of kids who come over that bridge every Friday to get the high premium cocaine. That's the microeconomic to the macro of Las Vegas. You you're guaranteed walking, drive, getting out of your car, telling Ethan to take a ride around the corner. Meet me here in five minutes. Me going upstairs. Picking up an ounce, running back downstairs, getting the car with Ethan and I'm safe because all those spotters are protecting that investment. Yeah. Do they have spotters like up the road to like let them know what cars are coming or is it just everything? Spotters are everywhere to but, let them know about the heat, competition, and the customers. And and within that community, nobody is going to risk stealing from you because you're actually damaging the big corporation. You see what I mean? So sure shit will happen. Probably, you know, you walk around, by the way, I, I, I hyperventilate walking down. If you have to walk from one casino to the other because getting in a car is going to take longer, so you walk and you're just constantly in a horde of people and it's the worst possible feeling, for sure dirty shit happens out there. But there's also tons of cops and tons of people and they know if, they, if, you, if you get robbed walking from one casino to another, you're stealing from the casino and you're going to get fucked. So it's that that's the micro thing of a small right. drug neighborhood and the macro is a neighborhood like Vegas. If kids start getting boosted, going to buy drugs, right. the drug dealers the drug are gonna get rid of those the, people. If right now a word gets out in the street that every time I go in the M gym and I go upstairs, I get robbed by my car, you're not gonna gamble at the M gym no more. Right, absolutely. You know, there's people who there's people who go to Las Vegas and they go to casinos where it's a million dollars just to get in there. You know what I'm saying? Like, you have to do a credit app and give them a million dollars just so they they feel safe. They feel safe. If I if I was a millionaire and I went to gamble in Las Vegas, you wouldn't see me at no low-end casino. You would see me at a casino with three dudes with fucking ARs at the door when I'm gambling. <laughs> Chicks with a bikini fucking passing out cigars, lighting them for you. Cop and Fields, they don't give a fuck about Harvey Weinstein. They never heard of what I want. Because every time you grab, I grab you, till they give you a $1,000 chip. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what reality is. And, I mean, it has, because, I, I, like, does, does it ever get frustrating as, like, a criminal? Because you must see, I see people there all the time with money hanging out, they're drunk. Like, it must be, it would be easy. Well, you know what? A casino has a thousand eyes on you. Right. Even if I pickpocket Ethan, before I hit that door, they're going to grab me. And, and, and anything, that, yeah, anything that's happening is probably happening with uh, without violence. You know what I mean? Right. Like uh, this guy, Apollo Robbins. You heard of him? He was the, the top pickpocket. You know, I think now he, like, works for the government in, in designing, you know, CIA identities or something. I don't know what he does now exactly, but he's, like, the top. He was the top pickpocket. He's done TED talks, and he could he could he could rob you without the cameras even seeing it. It looks like you had a friendly interaction. You have no idea what happened, and now he's got your wallet. So shit like that probably is happening, but they're not going to advertise that. 
Right, you just feel like you're drunk and you lost your watch or something. Or well, they're gonna take care of it. It's not gonna make the fucking paper. You know, right. things have uh, we read what we write. It's like right now. Look, uh, for twenty years, uh, comedy was whatever Comedy Central gave you. All of a sudden, a bunch of podcasters started getting a little fucking notoriety. Now Comedy Central's got egg on their face because they didn't show the real deal. Makes you think a lot about music. Yeah. Do we see the real deal in music or is what the label or what the Times calls for? Was there a band out there that was better than Led Zeppelin? Was there a band out there that was better than Black Sabbath? We didn't get to see them. So it's the same with news, especially now. You know, you watch 60, you watch World News Tonight, which I watch every fucking night with the chick. I started watching it with Diane Sawyer. They're, they're programmed for 48 minutes of horror. Yeah. And then the last 12 is uh, somebody who's making baskets in Kansas and making money. And the fucking <laughs> Japanese kid with one arm who plays the drums in a big band now because <laughs> he can play with his mouth and stuff. You know, they, they give you eight minutes of happiness. Com that's what the show is like. It compels you. Come back and we'll tell you about the passenger who saved the plane from going, you know. Now, they have this information. Could you imagine if, like, let's say, let's say when the Chinese guy got beat up on United, right? Let's say if the camera footage, before the footage would have come out, if United would have called CBS, NBC, Fox, and fucking whatever and said, look, I got 10 million for all of you to fucking pay that tape and never play it. Right. Chinese guy has a press conference, but there's no fucking tape nowhere. You know, I, I would go for something like that. I believe something like that could happen. Well, that's kind of what I was just going to say. Like They pick the news. There's, it's selective. They pick the news, but even just with what happened in Seattle where that guy stole the plane. Even though the new, I didn't hear it on the news online. I heard like the uh, him talking with the air traffic controller. Oh yeah, we got great footage of it. We had everything we would have needed from the news online. Right. That was the weirdest thing that happened Friday night because I was doing comedy in Kansas City, which I want to thank you if you came out to the shows in Kansas City. Fucking great <laughs> audiences. You guys saw. I took the fucking ride with you. The city was great. The barbecue was great. Everything was great. I get back to my room Friday night and I'm going. I'm watching whatever the fuck on Netflix or. And I checked Twitter at like one, and some fucking people are talking about this thing. And one guy says, uh, you know, uh, it's still too early for a comedian to make a joke about something <laughs> like this. So I fucking look at the guy's page, and it says comedian. And I go back, and I go, it's probably, t it's never too early, first of all, if you're a comedian. And if you're thinking that way, you're not really a fucking comedian, because a comedian takes social things like that and turns it around. into what I mean, there was just a bunch of, ever since Mauro Ronaldo did the thing about him uh, having the disease, you know, it's like all his followers, I think I follow Mara, and they were all like sympathizing really quick. I'm a comedian, dog. Whatever the fuck I'm gonna say, I'm gonna fucking say it. Uh, timing is everything in comedy. You know, that question pops up, when is it too soon? It's never fucking too soon. It's too soon, whoever thinks, whoever has the biggest dick in the room first is gonna drop that fucking bomb the quickest. Some people are going to react to it. Some I heard a fucking horrible, <laughs> brilliant joke the other day. I heard one of the most brilliant, horrible jokes I've ever heard in my life. Kevin Nealon goes, what do you guys think about the fucking Bourdain thing or some shit? He goes, when I heard, I didn't really fucking like the guy. He goes, I didn't like the fucking guy. I mean, the audience just froze. I froze. <laughs> I would name the say anything like that. He goes, I didn't like the guy. But then he goes, I started thinking about it. And I got something in common with the guy because he didn't like himself either. <laughs> oh, my God. How brilliant of a joke is that? Yeah. He goes, now I can't stop watching. He goes, I wish they'd pick him up for another season. Now, <laughs> Jesus, just brilliant. Brilliant. Well, what the fuck do you want me to tell you? Right. But we live in such a, and there was no pussies in that room that night. They took the ride with them. Well, the, the, you know, talking about the internet like this, like, we have much, guys like you are now, doing this getting much more not notoriety than maybe you would have had when it was just fox and cbs and and comedy central when when the only outlet for comedy was was comedy central yes it's much better now but also we have the situation where you know prior to the internet you had one politician get up and say something slightly snarky about another politician then you had to wait for the next politician to get a news conference together to make a retort, which just upped it a little bit. So it would take six months before they're actually in a big fight. 
And now the level of hostility in America is ramped so high. You have, you know, Republicans are all Nazis and uh, the Democrats are all communists. And you have everybody trying to shut everybody down with intense hostility. And there's this kind of like people are getting off on being outraged. And I think that's not productive. It's not. It's not productive at all. The internet is killing us slowly. It's giving us too much information at one time. I agree. Us, we're having too much fucking information. And, and just like drugs, just like alcohol, just like exercise, just like chicken cutlets, you have to give it a breather from day to day. You have to really, like, that's why on the weekends, I have a very low, once Friday comes, I try to stay off the internet as much as I can till Monday morning. Yeah. It's too much. It, and, it, and you read a lot of shit you shouldn't. And sometimes you go in a foxhole or videos or something like that that you shouldn't be watching. It has nothing to do with your life. Uh, you know, you can't even... On the computer I take on the road, I don't have Twitter and Facebook. Right. I have Smart. my Hotmail and yeah. I have writing apps and I have Netflix. That I do have. But I wanted to give it a break. I got an iPad. My wife got... There's no reason. Yeah. Give Facebook a fucking breather. It's too easy to get riled up, it's, man. And it's too much. And it's just... You know, you, uh, Facebook and Twitter, they're great for six or seven weeks. And then you get one week where you get all hate. Yeah. And you're like, where's this hate coming from? There's a Reddit thing and this and this. And you go, you know what? It makes you want to get the fuck off there. But yeah. there's so many good people on there that follow you and that interact with you. That you feel for them. But the internet has just given a voice to a lot of... It's given me a voice in a positive manner, but it's given people a, a voice in a negative manner. Yeah, the, the, the ability to highlight one sentence or one action from a person's life in the past and, and put a microscope on that thing and, and to call their entire existence this action or this statement that happened years ago... That's a weird, that's a weird, dangerous thing to do. That's a very odd power to hold over somebody. You know what I mean? Um, We're living in weird times. I'm an immigrant, and as you know, I did time. In fact, Wednesday is the 30th anniversary of me getting sentenced. Congrats. You've never said me, <laughs> you've never said me, you've never heard me say the word pig or anything negative about cops. I put myself where I put myself. I'm going to tell you something, Ethan Supley. On that day, I did something very bad. I took somebody against their will with a machine gun and I handcuffed them. And I was on it from day one. If you want me to lie to you and tell you, I was a victim and I knew about the trunk in the car. And I, we weren't going to kill him. We were going to put him on a bus to Arizona. It was uh, one guy that was doing it for a stripper and the other guy was just doing it to get $30,000. I just wanted to get my hands on $30,000. I thought thirty thousand dollars would bring all the happiness in the world to me at that time. Sure. Boy, was I fucking wrong. But let's be honest, I'm not the same person I was thirty years ago. That's what I mean. So what's going on now is a fucking embarrassment because I was raised in a country. I was raised to believe that you're fucking innocent to a proven fucking guilty. But if uh, Greg Garcia says that we went to college together in Virginia, one day I put my finger up his asshole. I lose everything I have because Greg Garcia says I put my finger up his asshole in 1980. Well, guess what, Greg Garcia? I was a different person in 1980. And fucking so were you. Maybe you wanted somebody to stick a finger in your asshole. You just remember now all of that's, a sudden. That's what I mean. That's, but, what, that's but what I'm saying. Beyond all of that, even, we're human beings. So, you know, I, I, I'm i not a Christian, but I think one of Jesus' principal teachings was that we're all flawed. You know what I mean? Every human being is flawed. So... Like, as long as that's the foundation from where we start our arguments or our, our fights and our outrage with people is that we're all flawed. Everyone's flawed. So if somebody did something that you consider more flawed 20, 30 years ago, where's the avenue to correct that? Are we just excising it and pretending that that shit's never going to happen again? Or are we going to talk about, like, how do we fix this problem? Do you know what I mean? I, I mean, I, I don't even know what I, James Gunn said. I didn't even read what he said, but I hear he got fired for something he said on Twitter 10 or 15 years ago or something like that. Can't the guy just say, you know, like, I'm embarrassed by what I said 
I didn't know what I was doing. I'm sorry I offended people. I'm going to work to not offend people in the future. Like, isn't that a more sane way to deal with that? We live in strange times. Social media is everything now. Uh, you know, we learned a big lesson from the Roseanne thing, whether she did the Ambien or not or whatever. I have a problem. I have a dilemma right now. I have a dilemma that I'm 55. I'm a stand-up comic. I have a podcast. And I want to do comedy. I'm not even the same person I was 10 years ago because I was on drugs 10 years ago. But today I smoke pot. Like I was telling the audience in Kansas City, I'm one of those guys that's sober, but not really. <laughs> like I smoke pot. I'll eat an edible if you have it from time to time. If you show up with a Viking, I'll fucking pop it. It's not that I'm going to eat these things all the time. But uh, I'm definitely not the same person I even was 11 years ago. I tell Lee, if we had this podcast 11 years ago, this podcast would have never made it because I wouldn't have showed up at 6 in the morning. Right. I was too paranoid to leave the fucking house at 6 in the morning. So I don't like that. I don't like what's going on in that realm where somebody could come up. That's why when I do this podcast, I tell people everything I've done. Right. I think that's the only way to bulletproof yourself. Just tell you know everything what I mean? You're done. a very open person. You so. have to. In yeah. today's world, I knew that I knew that this was going to trigger some people. So before anybody would say something, I might as well say it. And yeah. it makes me vulnerable. I want you to know about my life for two reasons. I want you to know about my life. And I want you to know that no matter what dilemma you get yourself out into, you get yourself out. Yeah. I'm no fucking five beta cap. You know right. what I'm saying? Sure. I'm no five beta cap. I quit high school and I got left back in the seventh grade. And somewhere or another, I figured it out. I never left. I kept getting on that fucking stage. I didn't give a fuck that I didn't go to Montreal. I didn't give a fuck what you thought. I'm telling you that I'm going to do this. And I kept doing it. I kept showing up. That's all. Yeah. I didn't do anything else that nobody ever did. By the way, how the fuck did you get into acting? No Juilliard? No nothing for you? No, 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 nothing. You were I, living I, out here? I, I, I dropped out of school when I was 14. I had a buddy who I knew, kind of, who was an actor. And I was like, you know, if you can do that... And, like, nobody's going to give you shit about being in school because you're you're working. Like, I might as well try and do that. And that's what I did. And I, I basically started working when I was 16. Jeez, and I, I, this whole time, all these years, I knew you. For some reason, I thought you had grown up in New York City like you were a PS19 type of guy. No. And then you, were, you went to Juilliard. Like, I always, I don't know why I had put this fake biography line like a like an actor cap like yeah, i wear like, like a fucking like one you, of those sideways hats with a feather and yeah shit. you do like a play in new york or something <laughs> then somebody saw you you know it's uh I have, i've had a lot of guys rap up a lot of guys have come in and they, they're all from new york and like for some reason but you went to whatever school out here yeah and then you got what was the first thing you booked boy meets world wow. first thing i booked what 1993 wow and you didn't stop by after that no I did, I did, uh, I did that for three years, and and like in my off time from doing that, I did a bunch of commercials, and I did um, the show Tales from the Crypt, which was fun back in the early '90s, um, and then I did Mall Rats with Kevin Smith, like a year into that, and then I started doing movies. What do you like better, movies or TV? Now that I have kids, I like TV because it's it's a schedule that you have some prediction on. It's not like I'm going away for seven months and I'm going to do this movie in Romania, which I've done. Um, so I think TV and there's there's it you know TV is another thing that with the with the with the advent of the internet and we have all this information, we also have so much television where I would say like a huge percentage of television is better than a lot of the movies they're making now which is really fascinating. And the majority of the movies that they're making now are either, you know, there's some cool independent films and then there's like, you know, uh, Transformer 6. That's kind of what you have in movies. And, and from when I was coming up in the 90s, we had this renaissance of indie film with guys like Quentin Tarantino. And I think all of that is now on television, which is great. That's crazy that you're saying that because television has grown leaps and bounds. Yeah. Especially with streaming. You see so much crazy fucking shit on streaming now that you could see TV taking a knock yeah. in a lot of places. Like yeah. just regular home TV. But I also know you from Eddie's. 
Yeah. That's how we met originally. Yeah. And I still remember going and, and reading from My Name is Earl and then seeing you at the table read. Yeah. We were very excited. And it's funny how uh, you were a lot bigger then. Yeah. I mean, yeah. your joint started at what? At what weight did you say one day I'm through with this shit? Man, I, I got together with my wife in... You know, it was a weird thing because I... I had girlfriends prior to my wife, but there was always a feeling of not belonging, really, for whatever reason. And then I got together with my wife in 2001, and, uh, and like, one of the first things she did was say, like, okay, we're together now. Now you're going to get on a diet. And that was, like, that changed my life. And, and, and I've basically been on a diet since then to one form or another but it was uh, I was probably uh, 500 pounds in 2001 and what are you at now? 300 beautiful and I've been lower than this a few years ago I was obsessed with riding bicycles and I got down to 220 but I actually felt too thin at 220 I went down to 268 and my head felt really big and yeah. my neck got really skinny, and I was going on a lot of auditions. And as soon as I walk in, they go, <laughs> like, what the fuck happened to you? Like, yeah. you got the hip all of a sudden. Like, yeah. what the fuck happened? Like, you're dying. When people are, yeah. Really look at you fucking weird. And there's always been that weird thing that they hire the fat guy. When you're fat, and when you lose weight, you're done. Like, that's been the big thing in Hollywood. Like, you're fucking done. Yeah. You've maintained. Well, no, I've gone back and forth. It was a weird thing, because when I was at 220... Every day I would look at myself and see how fat I was. But I was also racing bicycles. So, like, the objective there is to be as lightweight as possible. So I would be starving myself. I would only allow myself to eat while I'm riding the bike. I was riding eight hours a day, six days a week. Like, gnarly rides from Studio City to Oxnard and back. And, and... And then when I, when I was like, I can't maintain this because, number one, I'm riding so much I can't work. And number two, I'm like, nobody knows me. I'm so thin now that people are, when I go in to see them, people are like, who the fuck are you? We didn't want to meet with you. Where's the guy we wanted to meet with? So then when I kind of let it all go, I gained weight and I was heavier than I am now. And it was a real weird thing remembering being 220 and thinking I was so grossly overweight to being 320 and feeling great about myself. You, you know what I mean? And like my wife just says I have body dysmorphia, which I might, but like I don't feel uncomfortable in my body today. You know? Did, so did you feel uncomfortable at 220? 220, I felt pretty fat, yeah. I was 9% body fat. In the machine, like, I went and saw this guy, Dr. Heizenga, because he was on The Biggest Loser, and he was, like, the top sports nutrition guy, and he fucking scanned me, and he said, you're done. Don't lose any weight. And I was like, but I'm so fat. And, uh, yeah, so it was weird. So when you looked in the mirror, you saw a fat guy, or you felt fat? I, I probably just felt fat, because I don't know that I could have seen a fat guy. I don't know if that if that's totally honest, but but I definitely didn't feel thin. I never got to a place in my entire life where I was like that's it. I don't need to lose weight anymore. What's a disease that you look at yourself in the mirror and see yourself fat and you keep uh going 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 and then have to take it to the hospital and like I'm, I, I assume that's what like anorexics experience. I think it's something. what you said earlier, body dysmorphia. Body dysmorphia. Where you look body at yourself, and you okay. see something. I different. had a friend growing up that well, she went from being a hot piece of ass to this fucking skeleton. Yeah, but but then, but now it works both ways because I have the reverse body dysmorphia. Where at three fifty, I'm like <laughs> going to my wife like I look great. I don't need to fucking diet anymore, and she's like, shut the fuck up, put down the cupcake. You're fat. It's funny when you get body dysmorphia. I get body dysmorphia when I travel. Yeah. When you see yourself in a foreign mirror. Yeah. When you walk out of a bathroom and you're naked, you go, oh, shit. I didn't see that. What the fuck? Because you see what you your mind wants you to really see. Yeah. You, you see what your mind really wants you to see when you're looking at a mirror. Yeah, but your mind's not always right. No, 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 no. Don't no. they have skinny mirrors in hotels? Is that what it is? No. And there's some hotels that... You, you come out of the bathroom and you look at yourself and go, wow. What the 
fuck what is going the on? fuck is going on? Oh, in the bad way. Yeah. Oh. You see that thing hanging over. You don't see it in your house because in your house, you see what you want to see. Yeah. Gotcha. It's a weird fucking thing. What diets have you gone on? Just high protein? I've done... Ev- I, I have... Since I was a little kid, I've done every diet that's existed. So you've had this since... Oh, yeah, my whole life. Yeah, I've always been overweight. Um, uh, the, 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 the way I eat that I find the most sustainable is uh, I just got rid of anything processed. So I only really eat fruit. No, I don't eat fruit. I only eat meat and vegetables. That's it. And I don't even eat starchy vegetables. So I basically eat a small amount of salads and some meat. Red meat. Yeah, I eat red meat. I eat a lot of chicken. I eat red meat, turkey. I eat any kind of meat. Fish? Yeah, I don't love fish, but I eat fish. I mean, you look yoked now. You look like you're lifting now. That's all I do. I lift weights and I go on hikes. That's my exercise. How many days a week are you lifting? I lift five days a week. No shit. Yeah, and I hike five days a week when I have time. And it's not. And the lifting program is strength or muscle based? Like the strength. Really? Yeah. What kind of, like, deadlifts, that type of shit? Yeah, I do Olympic lifts. And then I'll, I'll, I'll become obsessed with one muscle that I want to increase the strength in, like my triceps. I, 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 I tore my bicep um, two years ago uh, doing a TV show. And so I don't ever do any bicep exercises, but I do, like, today I worked on triceps a lot for some reason. And traps... I always think dudes with big traps look tough, so I want big traps. Well, the Greek body was always an X. They devised it to be an X, so the traps should be strong. Yeah. It's really look weird when you look at somebody like James Caan, and he's got no traps. Yeah. The tricep, the weird thing about the tricep is it's got three heads to it. So when you really break down bodybuilding to the tricep, you really have to hit the tricep from three different angles because it's really three quarters of your arm. Yeah. A lot of people work on bicep work, but they really don't know that if they do like, uh, like uh, the the tricep extensions, you know, these fucking things from yeah, the dips. dips with weight, and then the, the the exercise that people really overlook that really tears your fucking upper body is pullovers. Yeah. Pull where you're over. laying down yeah and like just this, pull yeah. over with a straight bar with yeah. a lot of weight five sets of six you do that for a year you will get fucking yoked yeah you squat a lot i i haven't done squats in a while because i i had a knee issue a few years ago so i don't do a lot of squatting well they say after 40 you shouldn't really squat that much but you should do the machine then. yeah the, i i tend to just do hikes for legs and and I find that my legs are so dead after a long hike that I, I feel like that takes the place of actually doing resistance work with my legs. It does. It's your own body weight. You yeah. look phenomenal, man. And I know you've been at it for a while. I mean, I've been doing something, something for 16, always. 17 years now. Yeah. And how long? when do you go to jiu-jitsu now? Jiu-jitsu is very, very rare. I, I haven't been to jiu-jitsu in a while. It's been a, it's been a while. It's time you went back. Yeah. And I think go back and just tell the guy what you want to do. You want to do a closed guard game. Yeah. And I think it's good for the mental thought. I think I it, agree. I think it would be good to do jiu-jitsu till they put me in the casket. Yeah. Just to go in there one day a week. Get choked is very important. <laughs> yeah. Getting choked is very important. Getting know how vulnerable you are. Do you remember important. that British dude who fought in the UFC, used to work out, when we w- trained in Hollywood, um, he had a mohawk. I don't remember his name. Hardy, maybe. Something oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. James Hardy. James Hardy. Wait, wait, wait. No, right. that, that, that's football guys. You're right, you're right. That dude choked me out once. And I knew he had me in a, leg, in a, in a triangle choke, but I thought I could get out of it, and then I woke up. It was the most bizarre. I went out so fast. There was no time to tap. I thought... I'm going to work and get out of this. And then I was waking up. It was real fucking weird. And just so we don't get a bunch of stuff, it's Dan Hardy. Dan, Dan Hardy. Hardy. Yeah, yeah, good yeah. dude. Nice Dan, dude. Great guy. Great guy. I remember going to uh, uh, Houston's barbecue with him a couple times. Yeah. Him and Eddie and all those guys. 
that was a great group of guys when you guys were at the corner next to the Thai place. Yeah, that was fun. You know, Lee always asked me, why don't you ever expand your horizons? I needed different places. <laughs> I remember one day. <laughs> The audio listeners should have seen the look. I remember gaming. one night, I was trying to be a nice guy and just fit in. I think I'd gotten off the blow or something. And I go, let me meet these guys from uh, 10th Planet. And the, you guys used to always go next door. Yeah, to the Thai place. To the Thai place. And I don't eat Thai food for many reasons. I figured, <laughs> let me go in there and give it a shot. Maybe I'm being a fucking asshole. And I'm not there three fucking minutes. And I see a roach. <laughs> oh, man. I saw two roaches. One flew by me, and one was up in the corner. Like, what? What have you been sitting? On? What, Lee? I just want to know. I just want to know. Inquiring mind want to know. If you're sitting here with a girl, right? And you want to, you know, do whatever you want to do. And there's a cockroach. You're eating food, but there's a cockroach in that corner, right? Like what? And I'm not because they had the suspended ceiling, and the roach came out of the ceiling. Oh. What would you do? You get up. Here's the thing, and this is what I tell my kids. I got four kids. The U.S. DA, I guess, has an allowance for roach parts, maggots, fecal matter in every bit of food at the supermarket. You don't go through one meal without eating part of a roach or some bug or some rat shit or something like it. that. And that's if they look at it. Think of the places you went to. Over no, here okay. on Victory and fucking oh, Oxnard. Yeah. You're eating some some All right. you're eating food and you can you can hear you can taste the kid that get the kid's tears who lost his cock of spangle. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he, he says and, and, and it upsets me because I used to go to get dumplings in Koreatown and he said, Look for one stray cat. I dare you to find one stray cat. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Dogs, parakeets. There ain't an animal oh. that's you know, I don't, it's so God weird it. how every time I, and I got to tell you this, this is the truth. Today I went to strength train and I had to do something at 12 and I didn't have time. So I went and I got chicken and broccoli. That's as harmless as I could, I could get. <laughs> at the Thai, the Thai place? No, I do not step Chinese. to the Thai places I, I at all. I can't fuck with chicken and broccoli because it's got sugar in it at the Thai place. This I tell them, at the, not the Chinese place, I tell okay. them, take the sugar out and just yeah. the white wine or whatever. And I got to tell you something, this is a great place. They have a, Couple of dishes that are sensational. I gotta tell you something. Whenever I'm eating chicken at a Chinese restaurant, I know I'm getting something else. Like I, <laughs> something else is in there. Parakeet, a right. pigeon. There's something else in there. Like they give you some chicken, but those pieces of meat that you really can't really it's recognize. A little, a little darker, a than, little usual. darker than usual. They just throw a couple things in there. Like they don't give. If, me- if I actually ever found out that I ate something like that, that's when I lose a hundred pounds because I just wouldn't eat. I can't. I, I have to put that out of my mind. No, I you know have to happens, assume that. Yeah, it's a great thing you I mean, said today. I, I love food so much. I want to eat pigeons. I oh. want to eat parakeets. I want to eat all of it. That's a, you're, you're opening my uh, horizons. My food's so limited. You tell me there's a place serving great parrot, I'm in. Oh, my God. There's all these places. When I was a kid, there was a place called the Mai Kai. <laughs> we used to go to the Mai Kai. had a fucking tremendous uh, buffet, Chinese buffet. Yeah. And it was stab in the middle behind the Mai Kai was a cemetery, a fucking cemetery behind the Mai Kai. We would go in the Mai Kai. That was where I saw. You can't I used to have a buddy Roger that used to. We'd catch him at the Mai Kai before uh, uh, Giant Games. He'd be getting fucking tuned up, and he owned the bartender. I forget what the bartender's name was. Doesn't matter. But when we walk in, he go sit down, have a drink, and he get this is how tuned up he had the bartender. He'd go to jail for doing this. He called the bartender and go. Bend over, and the bartender go like this, and he go ha, ah! and he just karate chop in the neck. And just... <laughs> you go to fucking jail for that. Yeah. They just throw you out for fucking racism. He would just give the guy like a ten. Here you go, come on, show him the neck. Ha, ah! and he just karate chop the guy, oh and the God. guy would take him in the neck. <laughs> I remember one time when they had spare ribs <gasps> on the all you could eat fucking buffet that were delicious. They were big spare ribs, but they cut them in half. Yeah, so you could eat. Me and my buddy went in there one time we're like pick up the fucking one side as we were walking with the tray the Chinese guy came out stop stop we dined and dashed in there 80 times growing up I can't tell you the amount of damage how many times I went to my with my mother to the Mai Kai dog one day they went in there and they found that the meat was all cats they found the cats hanging up upside down and the grass they were putting in the fucking food was the grass in the cemetery like these people were just fucking torturing people 
thank God I was 12 and 15 when I went in there. Your stomach is like a billy goat. Like, you don't even know what the fuck you're eating. But I'm sure I ate animals and alligator meat and shit. Now, all those years, you were... uh, you were with jujitsu, whatever. You made a great point before. You were, talking, you were fucking, you hit it right on the spot. You're like, you know, I enjoyed jujitsu and everything, but it's also 2018, you know. And I always go back to that scene in Indiana Jones, where either the guy has the sword or the new chucks or whatever, and he comes out and he does all this thing. And Indiana Jones, without fucking even looking takes his gun out and shoots the guy and puts the gun back in his holster and walks away or whatever. Yeah. There's a scene in that. I think jujitsu is <clears throat> amazing exercise and uh, amazing techniques for specific situations. If I'm walking back to my car, I'm just going to avoid people. And if somebody gets close to me, I don't want to roll around with on the ground with him if I don't know who's around me. I mean, we talked about this, you and I, about social anxiety. Constantly thinking about who's around me. And how are you going to guarantee if somebody blindsides you that he doesn't have three friends there? So you, you take him down into guard, one of their friends could tee off on your head. Or maybe he's got a knife. Those are a lot of variables. For MMA, it's amazing. If you're walking around in your life on a mat, and you know that dude doesn't have fucking, you know, MRSA or some other skin disease and you're comfortable rolling around with him and you want to challenge each other, that's great. But I don't know about it in in the day and age where everybody's got guns and knives and, and friends waiting around the corner. And I don't go out to situations very often where I'm around many people because I don't like those situations. So I, I'm just never going to get into a fist fight like that where I would need it. Do you know what I mean? No, I understand. Hold that thought. I'm going to put on Tony Bennett. Let me go. I'm, I'm over 50, so I got to pee every 45 yes, minutes. Let me go take a quick pee, and we'll continue on that thought. I was thinking about something yesterday. I got home at 8.30 in the morning, and there was a seminar for jiu-jitsu at 12, a side control seminar. And there was also Alberto Crane at 12. And I had a couple of options, but I only slept three hours the night before. I slept till about 1.30, and... My wife came home, we ate lunch, and she goes, the baby got invited to a swim thing. Do you mind if we go? And I go, no, no, no. You know, I, I, I can do a thousand things. So I went over to cryotherapy, and I, I went over to the weed store, and I filled up the, week, the car for the week, and I made notes, and uh, I was still bored. And I said, you know, it's 4 o'clock. They're not going to be home until 5 o'clock. I put boxing gloves on, and I got a boxing bag in my backyard. And I went out there, and I started hitting it, boom, boom, and I... So I doing push-ups and sit-ups. I got a kettlebell and I did a couple swings. Then I started stretching and I get up and do Muay Thai drills and stuff. And as I was putting everything away, I was like, you know what, man? That was uh, 35 minutes. I put it down on weight wenches and my T-shirt was really wet. And I'm like, how lucky am I that I'm 55 and I'm able to move around? What I know now, like it's 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 helpful for me for comedy to move around. I walked into a jiu-jitsu studio. Listen, when I met you with Eddie, and said, I love Eddie, but I always thought jiu-jitsu were for people who had the desire to stick it up my ass. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't know what that means if somebody gets insulted. I always thought that if you wanted to roll, it's like, roll around with a guy, it's like somebody coming up to me and telling me they got a man crush. What's next? You want to suck my dick? You know what I'm saying? But I walked into a jiu-jitsu studio when I was 49 years old, and I fell in love. And what really made me fall in love with it was how bad a shape I was in and how ill-prepared I was in case something did go down. Yeah. I don't want to be a UFC fighter. I do not want to be a tough guy. I do not want to be a bully. I don't want to be none of those things. But I always want to at least last two minutes. Sure. If, if you're kicking me and I can at least get the underhook and grab your belt and spin you over, jiu-jitsu paid off for me. You know? 100%. I'm not knocking you. No, no, no. If... Uh, if I could kick a motherfucker really hard in the leg, which I can't. It's 300 pounds coming at you. I've been kicking since I was fucking five. Yeah. All I got are two good kicks. But if I connect with those two kicks and I can get to my car, I'm good yeah. at this age. At this age, uh, when you have to take care of yourself at this age. You know, when you're going to hit 50 in a few years and everything changes. Everything changes, you know. That's why I read up about jujitsu over 40 and I was doing it all wrong. 
Like Mondays, you just have to be drilling and you roll once or twice and you leave. Wednesday, you come back, you drill, but you roll three times. Then Friday, you drill less and roll, and then you take two days off. That's over 40 jiu-jitsu. Yeah. And with people that are not going to get you in heel hooks and knee, knee locks and all that shit, because you don't need that. You cannot be unemployed. No, yeah. I also you have, cannot be had unemployed. Knee surgery. Yeah, it's so just not. It's the, there's all these things, these aspects, but I'm happy that I'm prepared now. What are you prepared for, Joey, to beat me up? I didn't say that. No. I'm prepared to just get to my car before the cops get there or before something worse could happen, before sure. it escalates even worse. I also believe in the power of the gun. I also believe I just have the felonies and I'll never get a license. But from time to time, a friend takes me to shoot now and, you know, I'm, I've been working. back When I was a kid, I wanted to be a hitman. Yeah. You, talk, you spoke about two things today. I want to be a hitman, but the most thing I want to be was a pickpocket. Yeah. Uh, there was a movie uh, Michael Saracen and James Coburn did called Harry in Your Pocket. Yeah. It was about hit, uh, pickpockets at the, the track or the airport or something, you know. So when you mentioned that guy's name, before, uh, this he, is what really, He's amazing, that guy. So what's his a, name? A, Apollo Robbins. Apollo and Robbins. And you just watch his, he's got a TED Talk. And on his fucking TED Talk, he's on camera the whole time because it's TED. And so they're filming him. He he does he pulls off some crazy shit which you which I then I, I watched his TED talk five times because he he's just misdirecting you the whole time while the cameras are on him and, and shit's happening that you're not noticing and then at the end he points it all out and you're like holy fuck that guy that guy being a pickpocket loose in Las Vegas he's robbing everyone he's robbing everyone blind and then he's having to put on disguises because eventually the casino figures out. Oh, that interaction, that that's when that guy got robbed. Because people go and complain eventually when they get robbed. Um, and I believe eventually the casinos hired him to say, what do we look for? Help us find the pickpockets. He's an amazing guy. It's uh, nuts that a couple weeks ago I was looking for My Name is Earl, you know, and I asked... Lee, is it still on Netflix? And he goes, no, it's on Hulu. And I watched a few episodes. And you did something, and I laughed. You and your fucking crazy brother. And then two days later, here you are on Blow. They've been playing on HBO lately or something. And it's the part where you, Tuna runs into the fucking thing, and I go, look how big he is. And That was right, right before I turned my life around, too. That had to be 98, 99, yeah. or something like that. I mean, you were up there, and then I went online, and you're talking about being at your sister-in-law's concert, and uh, you had your back against the wall, and all that. And I thought you were goofing at first. No. I thought you were goofing around at first, and I hit you back up, and I go, do you suffer from that social shit, too? And you're like, yeah, I'm looking at the doors, and my back's <laughs> against the wall. What's going on, and how long have you had it? You know, I think that... That has been a really helpful way to to deal with it. If I'm at a concert or something like that, which I would just rather not be at, honestly, but I got kids and a wife and people who like being out in public, then I, I can just put all of my attention on, okay, if something happens here, how do we get out? If I look around, do I see any obvious threats? Do I see any unobvious threats? Like, what's going on? And as long as I keep myself busy with that, I'm not... I'm not, I'm okay, I'm kind of fine, you know, as long as I have that thing to do. But just being comfortable with myself in the presence of a lot of people, I'm just not comfortable. Since when? For my whole life. I've never been comfortable. You know, I used to like to go to punk rock concerts a lot, and there was something about the energy and the acceptance at a punk rock concert because there was no... There was no single group, uh, there was, you know, uh, like you go to a hip hop concert and maybe you're wearing the wrong colors and then it's an issue and you've got a problem that that didn't exist from from what I experienced in punk rock in the 80s and, and early 90s. You just go and you have fun and you wind up a little bit bruised but exhilarated. And, and that was the closest I got to being comfortable in a crowd. But there was some violence there. You, you know what I mean? Like, there was some over-violence happening. And that was the only way 
that I really felt comfortable, which is kind of depressing, I guess, if you think that, that a couple people got smacked, so you felt right at home. Maybe or... maybe they got smacked. Maybe I got smacked. You know, I, I, I was just more comfortable with that, with knowing exactly what's going to happen and and what it's going to be like and and going in there and enjoying it. I haven't really enjoyed a concert since I was a teenager. They, they just make me terribly uncomfortable being around all those people. What about after the situations in Vegas and Orlando, Florida? Does that add to your Honestly, fuel? Honestly, no, that doesn't bother me. I'm not worried about I'm not worried about getting shot. I'm more I'm more just uncomfortable being surrounded by people than I am. It's not that I'm scared of getting shot. Um, I've been to Vegas since then. I've, I've been to Florida. I, I, that I don't know that, that that doesn't really worry me too much. Now, how are you in front of a camera? A camera is, is I'm I'm pretty comfortable in front of a camera when there's 40 people on a set. Well, I'll tell you what. If we do a table reading, we sit down and and we're we're just reading in front of the crew. I'm I'm terrifically uncomfortable. But once we're doing it and the camera's there, those people don't exist. It's just what we're it's just this universe that we're pretending into existence. You, you, you know what I mean? So I was, it doesn't bother me. I was having a hard time with stand-up at the store, especially anxiety. Yeah, being in front of a crowd oh, like that, I, I, that I can't. Especially, and, and I couldn't figure out why. I couldn't figure out what the fuck was going on. Why would I have been going to this place? I went in there to showcase for Mitzi Shaw. I'm already out of the weeds. Why am I going in here 20 years after stand-up comedy that I've been doing it? This is my home. And why is it that after I walk up five steps, this whole feeling comes over my head? So I did what everybody else in America does. I went and got Xanaxes, and I would take one. As soon as I hit the comedy store, my heart starts pumping, and I would take one or two. And as soon as I, I look for a safe passage, once I don't see a safe passage, that's when I panic. Like yeah. Right now, that window has those little blinds on it that are fucked up. That's safe passage for sure. Me. I know that that's safe passage. Like when I go give blood down at Bob Hope Medical Center, I don't let them take blood out of in a room with no windows. Yeah, because there's no safe passage for me. I've been doing comedy all my life. Why does this hit me now? Yeah, where is this coming from now? And for you to type that that night, I was like, this guy does fucking. He's one of them. You know, you're on the set with Johnny Depp and 40 fucking people. Yeah. Now you want to get this social anxiety now, but you've always had it. Yeah, I've never felt comfortable around around a lot of people like that. I've I've always I, that that safe passage. I've found it's exactly the same. I have to have. I'm. I will literally stand in a corner until I can figure out. But it's got for me. It's slightly more literal because I want to find an exit. How if I have to get out of here? How am I going to do that? And I'm not worried about being shot. What if the building catches fire? Well, you know, uh, I don't know. I it could, it's just all fantasies constantly going in my head. I right. just want to know how right. I can get the fuck out of there if I have to. Now, when you went to jujitsu the first time and somebody mounted you, how did you feel? <laughs> That's not a good feeling. <laughs> oh, my God. That is not a good feeling. Especially when you have that little thing. Sure. I made mistakes in the beginning of jujitsu, and I'm like, I'll take an edible. And go to jujitsu. Oh my god. No good, huh? The first time somebody mounts you and you go to hip escape and hip mom them and they don't go nowhere, I'd have to tap. And I'd run outside, I'd take my gi top off, and I'd have to pee. Yeah. Like that's how much fear I would put myself through the first month and a half of jujitsu. If I don't go to jujitsu for three or four days now, when I go back I still have fear walking in. That's why when I go into jiu-jitsu, the first thing I do is put my gi on and roll around with somebody. Yeah. Roll around, get beat as up, a breathe up heavy, even. just to, yeah, as a warm-up. Just to, it's a warm-up for my fear. Sure. It's a warm-up for my fear. And when I go to a comedy club now, I don't bring the Xanax with me no more. The little baby, whatever the fuck, 1.5s they give you. I force myself to talk to people. This is how I got out of the fear. 
Yeah. I force myself to talk to people, and I find something to fucking aggravate the fuck out of me. Yeah. For me to get that little spark of anger going. Well, I think I think that's very smart. Because, very smart. Yeah. A- anything that can irritate you, I, I I've honestly found Joey through through however many years I've been dieting and I've been sober for a long time, which I would rather not be, honestly, if I'm being like completely honest, I would, but I need to be, you understand? But I've found that everything worthwhile is painful. And if you get into that and you somehow find a way to enjoy that pain and that suffering, then you're just better off. You, you, you earn the outcome. You know, you go into a comedy store and you find something to irritate you who wants to go around being irritated? Nobody wants. That's not just two minutes before I sure. go on stage. Of course, two minutes before I go on stage, I have to find something from my past. Uh, that fucking guy's got sandals on. That motherfucker. You know that the other day, some guy walked past me. I was pissed because he had body odor, and I'm like, "That's a hummus eater." <laughs> just to myself, I called him a hummus eater, and I giggled. And there you go, boom! Right. I won the war. Yeah, I just beat the war on myself. You yeah, know, just cracking that fucking joke. I even called Lee and said something about the hummus eater. We were howling. He goes, "Well, people are gonna look at it like you're being racist." I go, "No, he was a white dude, but I could tell you he was a fucking hummus eater. I could I smell the hummus on his neck, <laughs> kind of like when he has hummus. The flies chase him in here all the time because <laughs> they fucking do your neck." But last night I was blown away. I was blown away last night because it was uh, as the girls were walking in. I was scrolling. I always go to see what's on 60 Minutes. And then I scrolled down, and it was the la- autopsy. So have you ever watched it at all? No. It's called Autopsy, The Final Hours Of. I saw Amy Winehouse. I saw Whitney Houston really died of. She didn't die of cocaine overdose. She died because her body was numb. And when she got into a hot tub, the tub cooked her. Oh, really? Yeah, like the hot water just basically cooked it. Right. But she couldn't feel it. You know, you really learn about George Michael. But last night they had Chris Cornell. And I just had a, like they had the, a couple of weeks ago, they had the last days of James Gambafini. Right. And then, you know you got to watch that one because yeah. we're heavy dudes. You yeah. know what I'm saying? But this one was very interesting. First of all, it said that he found a box of Beatle albums. Let me tell you something. You're too young. I think you guys are too young. Does anybody remember Beatle people? No. Like people who really are into the Beatles. I mean, I know people okay. who are really into the Beatles. Like I told the story on here. Before John Lennon got shot, it was a different country. Music couldn't, you can, Bruce Springsteen, Born to Run, that's a great album. Yeah, wait till the Beatles get back together. You know, everything was that. Right. There was always one motherfucker in the room that always had to go, yeah, that's good, but wait till the Beatles got back together. And you would have to sit there and take it because they were the kings at that time. Sure. You know? When John Lennon got shot, 20 people were fucking hysterical. They were like, fuck you and the Beatles because there was all these Beatle fans that went crazy. Right. You know, nobody remembers really when John... I love John Lennon. I ain't saying nothing bad about John Lennon, but when he got shot, there was a lot of things in New York. And I remember going to New York and seeing these people fucking crying. And I couldn't understand it. Like, I, I like John Lennon. I like fucking... Uh, that one solo album, man, all that shit. But Jesus, these people are fucking like upset, you know. So now I I could understand the Chris Cornell thing because I got upset when Chris did that. I got a little upset, so I watched this thing last night, and they showed how he was a big Beatle guy, and his parents were Alkies, and he was obsessed with the Beatles, and he just. When he was 13, 14, he was already doing fucking drugs. Right. And uh, when you do PCP, he was doing what I was doing. PCP and fucking angel dust and smoking weed and uh, tripping. He was a a big tripper. And at that age, when your mental state, when your your mind is not even developed, our minds weren't even developed. Yeah. Dangerous. That's not bueno. You know, that's not bueno. So your receptors freeze and all this shit. They're explaining all this stuff about what serotonin and this and that. How once you do all this stuff, you, you know, at the time of Chris Cornell's death, he was completely sober. Right. There was no pills found in him. There was, Wasn't he taking Xanax? So, no. There was nothing in there. There was nothing. No alcohol. No nothing in his autopsy. Right. They were saying that he was slurring up on stage and stuff like that. And they just said that. It's like Bourdain, his suicide really bothered me. Because we're from the same neighborhood. Yeah. That's a Catholic fucking neighborhood, G. 
they don't believe in taking swan dives. Yeah. So for him to take a swan dive, so I started narrowing down what we had in common, which is drug use. Prior, young, drug use. Right. So for a guy like me, it scares the shit out of me. You know, my wife goes to bed at nine. I sit in the living room by myself. By 11 o'clock, I got a noose. You know what I'm saying? But they were talking about Cornell's mind. All those years, he wrote Pretty Noose and fell on Black Days talking about his right. depression. So they just said that his depression got the better half of him that night. And right. That's why he killed himself. Wow. But I'm, I'm petrified now. Now with all these... I get those. You know, I saw a lot of death as a kid. That's a little PTSD-ish, you know? Yeah. And the drug use, you know, that that was eminent. That was... An, and I want to... I was telling Lee, when I was 16 or 17, I went on a year one time where I did acid every other day, every day. Yeah. I was selling Microdot. I was selling it. So I would, my tolerance was built from... When people were taking one hit of acid, I was taking four. Yeah. You, you, you familiar at all with any of the tenets of AA? You know? You familiar with AA at all? Yes, absolutely. Like... One of their principles is take it a day at a time. You Absolutely. Know? For me, quite often, I have to I have to contract that to just getting through a moment, you know. And 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 if I can decide to get through a moment, I know that there will be a moment where I'm no longer in whatever state of suffering that I'm in, w whether it's. An urge to do something I know logically to be the wrong thing to do, like drugs or alcohol, whether it's um, just being overly emotional about something, wanting to make any decision based on emotion. I just get, if you just get through the painful moment, you know, shit will open up. You know what I mean? I was telling Lee a couple, to, you know, Mitchie Shaw died. And uh, we took edibles that night. We had a podcast on Sunday night, and that was the night of her wake down at the store. And I got so much anxiety about thinking of going to that wake and seeing all those people. So I just shit the bed. I, I just decided not to go. But it, was, it wasn't until I went, went home. And I was going through this fucking mental state, like just this confusion. You know, she did so much for me. How would it look if I didn't go down there? But I knew if I went down there, a guy was going to go down there, and I would pick a fight with him. He's going to pick a fight with me. Something's going to happen. I was shooting that Netflix thing, so I said, "Let me avoid this whole situation." But that night, I did that whole situation drug free, like beside the edible. Like I didn't do anything else that night. I you at what I'm saying is that at that situation when I usually have those little my heart speeds up, I would usually take two of those little fucking baby Xanaxes and smoke a bunch of pot. That night, I let myself work it out. You know, I was even, I even found myself sweating at one point, letting my mind work it out. You know, like you said before, bro, if you're a Christian, you know, we're not all perfect. We all have flaws, you know. Yeah. And I know that I got something mentally that's not right. I mean, if not, I would have become a doctor instead of a stand-up comic. Sure. The chemical balance is not right when you become a fucking stand-up comic. Something's yeah. not right. But... I respect it. It's like cocaine now. It's like when you go to a rehab and you come out and you say to yourself, I understand what cocaine is. Once you understand it, you know what it is. Yeah. I know what cocaine is. I know what heroin is. I know what Oxycontin is. I know I could smoke 55 joints and live my life. Right. You know? So for me, I've considered going clean, but I wouldn't make it. I'm not I'm not insisting no, you no, go no, clean. No, 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 yeah, no, yeah, yeah. no, 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 no. I'm too fucking old. It's it's the weed makes me feel like I'm doing something I'm not supposed to be doing, so I'm okay with that. Right. It's not robbing banks. It's not breaking into people's houses. Not yeah. hitting people over the head with a flashlight. It just makes me feel like I'm still sure that little criminal I was. Yeah. Just the weed. Now I I have I have nicotine and caffeine for for that very reason because I, I need to have some vice. There has that, to be absolutely. Some vice. Yeah. So you what you do is you pick the worst one for you. You know, Lee got on Twitch mm -hmm. and you're gonna play games and stuff like that. Yeah, starting this week. And Lee was asking me to you ever play games, and I go, yes and no. Uh, no, when I was a kid, because I didn't have I didn't like Monopoly. But after hearing Rogan one day, Rogan was hooked. Rogan was fucking addicted to Quake. 
It's like 20 hours a night of Quake. He would go home just to play Quake in those days. Like, see you and go, see you. And I would, you know, call him for days. And what happened, dog? I went into a foxhole. And this one, he wasn't getting high at all. Nothing. So it was like, your whole life is basically a transfer of addiction. Yeah. If you have an addictive personality, it's just a transfer of addiction. Yeah. And you end up in the one that causes the least for you. If if you're if you're on a healthy path, right. If you're on not on a healthy path, you wind up. Listen, dead. if you came to me and you go, listen, Joey, I don't want to do coke no more. I want to smoke crack. I don't want to suck fucking midget dick. But I tell you what, I want to do. I want to eat cheeseburger. I want to eat two cheeseburgers a day, and in the middle, I'll have a fucking slim fast shake for right. lunch. Know, it I sounds could, like a decent. Damn. Yeah. That's what I want you. To, I would just want you to be happy. Yeah. Happiness is the whole key to this. You know, there's people that take sobriety and they turn it into being unhappy. If that's the case, then find the happy medium. Yeah, like, yeah. Listen, in 94, I got, I got out of prison in 90-something, and 95, I got this opportunity to become a comic. And the, before anything, I did a mental inventory. In those days, I used to do the Abe Lincoln clothes. You know, you take a sheet of paper and put a line down the middle and put the positive effect and the negative effect. Yeah. And start writing. Let's be honest here. But you got to be totally honest to do this shit. What is the effects? And I came up with something. I said, you know what? I'm not going to stop someone coke. This bullshit live life that I'm living, going to an NA meeting and then staying sober for three days and for one day walking around confused. I'm an addict. Nothing I could do. But I'll tell you what I can do. I can get on stage every night. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get on stage every night and I'm not allowed to do cocaine until I get off stage. Right. And that, oh, oh, and listen, it fucking worked. We're here today, are we not? <laughs> right. We're here today. You have to you have to have your barriers. So you have to do what works for you. Eventually, you, and then I saw the movie Ray, and it said that he did heroin until 63, and here I am, 44, and I'm like, is that what I want? I want to blow my, I want, I want to get successful to continue doing cocaine so I could quit when I'm 63. That's not life. Right. Because when you're addicted to something like that, as you know, it's a prison. Yeah. It's a prison. It's a mental prison. You know that. Sure. So that's that's why I'm happy that I'm fucking sober, you're sober. We deal with these social issues. Yeah. But we keep them like I hate going to fucking Hollywood things. I yeah, I can't. I'm like, like I'm I, done. I basically borderline can't like, do it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Like, I'm done. Like I went to one because I had done three episodes that were very nice. I said, let me go. I took my wife. It was a date night. You know, when you have a five-year-old, you got you to give your wife a stab and then get her out of the house. If not, they just become a fucking mom and they go into fucking mommy fucking to talk all the time, you know? Yeah. So I try to take her out as much as I can and we went and I had, I had again, my back was against the wall looking for an exit strategy. I couldn't hear what people were saying to me. I also just feel so out of place in Hollywood things like I have no business no being, business there. being there no business well, being there yeah it, it, the, the Hollywood things are particularly rough I think they're rough you have to be and, and, and like you would go to a Hollywood thing and you, you did eight episodes of the show you're obviously part of the cast <clears throat> but then you see me there and you go hey Joey how are you good to see you and you look at me and go I did eight episodes of 12 did you do some of the episodes and I'm like no I'm just here to say hello. You're like, what are you doing here? I, I worked on the show. Well, by, by the way, I I could never have that point of view because I'm always wondering what the fuck I'm doing. I'm doing it. Yeah, like, I'm, uh, I'm, I did the you're show. Here. Why am I here? I did the show. Right. And I, I still don't know why I'm here. And I don't know why I'm here. I can't imagine why the fuck you're here. Yeah. Ethan, it's been a pleasure, hey, man. man. Always it, good to talk to you, It's been a fucking pleasure. What, uh, what are you working on now? I have a show on Hulu that is is done. We did twenty episodes. It's called Chance, and we're finished with it. But I, I I'm particularly proud of it. I thought it was really good. A couple couple slow episodes in the beginning, but it's just taking its time, and then it warms up. Really fun. Right now, I'm doing a show called um, The Santa Clarita Diet for Netflix. I'm doing this season. You're a bad motherfucker. How many years so far in say? Fuck. 24? Can you believe that? 25? 25, maybe. I, I'm not even totally sure. I think I'm 20 this year. Yeah. Do we get our pensions yet? Yeah, 55. 55? 55. 
I get my pension. I could go for an early pension right now oh. if I want to leave it there. I don't want it. No, I don't, I don't want, want to my either. discount from Denny's either. I'm still slinging dick at 55. Who gives a shit? Joey, I got four kids to put through college. I'm going to be working until I'm 90. Good. Yeah. Because when you fucking stop using it, you lose it anyway. That's right. So at least you're looking forward to it. You look great. You too, man. It was great to see you. Uh, I'm happy you came on the church, and thank you, brother. Yeah, and thanks anytime for having you want to promote anything, anytime you want to just talk, anytime you want to get out of the house, you know, you're welcome here. You're fucking family. It's yeah. great to see you. Don't forget, next Thursday, I'm at uh, Levity Live in Huntsville, Alabama, and then Friday and Saturday, I'm at Nashville Zanies. Two shows on Friday, two shows on Saturday. Tickets are on sale right now. And that's basically it. I'll see you motherfuckers Thursday morning. Don't forget... Always, my motherfucking heart on it for all your supplements, whether it's Alpha Brain, Shroom Tech, Shroom Tech Sport, Shroom Tech Immune, uh, New Mood, you know, the, the Elk Jerky. Listen, I love those guys. Number two, go to honor.com right now and press in. Church, I get 10% off delivered right to your fucking crib. You don't even have to leave the goddamn house. And like I said before, if you're thinking of getting into jiu-jitsu or you're in jiu-jitsu, you want a tough, dependable gi that they can hang off you, whatever, Fuji Sports, whether it's a 96 dollar all season light one because they're lightweight it's not like you have a fucking some guy hanging on you you know what i'm saying these are lightweight it's like having a t-shirt on you the elemental gi is tremendous the, the super rito is tremendous the psycho point two go to fujisports.com and press in church bam and then they're right there motherfuckers i love you i love ethan i love the fucking christ killer and i love me too but most importantly i love you motherfuckers see you thursday morning tip top magoo ready to fucking stab a motherfucker in the neck Kick that mule, Lee.